In this chapter, you will learn something about the diversity of life in the oceans. You will learn that every day scientists are discovering new life forms uh, in very remote places such as the deep sea or the polar oceans. Uh, and we will talk about the adaptations that marine life has to very extreme and unique conditions. And let's start with those adaptations. Um, so we have <coughs> vast ocean areas that are below one kilometer of water depth and actually there's even life other than microbes so real life say of fishes and worms in the deep deepest ocean trenches that are deeper than 10 kilometers this translates to an hydrostatic pressure uh, on to one centimeter square of their body surfaces of one metric ton as a matter of fact uh, scientists don't really know how many species other than microbes which we leave out of the picture here so um, animals and plants live in the oceans there has recently been a very large international effort the census of marine life that came up with about 200,000 animal and plant species many new to science but this is definitely not all we would find in the oceans we can do extrapolations uh, either uh, with increasing sample area or increasing sampling effort and we find that depending on the assumptions in those extrapolations we actually have to expect probably one than more than one million species in the oceans that means at least four-fifths of those are completely unknown to science at the moment we know for sure that life originated in the oceans about uh, it's it's uh, estimated that it originated about three billion years ago and there are credibly credible hypotheses that life in <coughs> terms of very primitive cells has emerged actually in the vicinity uh, of uh, hydrothermal vents firstly using um, uh, energy rich anorganic substances that came out of the earth interior so these cells would be the ancestors of bacteria and archaea so unicellular organisms we already know today then it took a quite long time so more than one billion years that more complex cells emerged so cells having a nucleus and having other compartments specialized organelles for example the mitochondria for energy metabolism that partly emerged as uh, in the process of endosymbiosis and those complex cells then gave rise to all other animals, plants and protists we know today. And again, this is for sure has been a marine process. The tree of life, therefore, is the, um, is the connection of all life forms, since life originated only once, that connect us through the eons of time until this very day. And it includes also, of course, us humans. Now let's focus a little bit more uh, to again stress the marine importance in understanding biodiversity in general. So let's look at only the tree of the more specialized uh, organisms that have eukaryotic uh, cells with the specialized organelles. And if you look at, at that tree, we see several interesting features. First of all, uh, this tree um, of higher cellular life is almost entirely marine. Then we have several points where multicellularity, so macroscopic uh, plants, uh, emerge from this unicellular organisms. And we also see here depicted as at the, with the arrows that the diversity we find on land in form of land plants uh, and animals and fungi is extremely limited. So it's really the tip of the branches, all the massive, uh, all the massive bigger branches and the trunks of the of the major uh, groups of organisms it's all marine in other words the deepest phylogenetic information and also genetic information that could be utilized for biotechnology comes from the sea uh, and only a very limited section of that diversity then made it to land the green plants come from uh, green algae so they they the sister groups or the ancestral group are green algae that we still find today in the oceans and uh, uh, the animals originated in an as yet unknown process during the Cambrian explosion. So what's then the Cambrian explosion? That's a very interesting point in time. 
approximately 560 million years ago when out of almost the nowhere suddenly uh, all the major animal bow plants emerged. Again, you see the marine legacy here when I tell you that 28 of those phyla are marine uh, and uh, of those uh, only 11 are terrestrial or freshwater. That again tells you that uh, the bulk of the deep diversity is contained in the oceans. So now starting from that Cambrian <coughs> explosion or, or species uh, radiation, we can distinguish many, many phases uh, in the geological history of the oceans. We go quickly through some of them because they are interesting. Uh, so one is the jellyfish ocean. So the very first predators of the open ocean were cnidarians and comb jellies, uh, an unrelated a different phylum of a gelatinous uh, large zooplankton. Then other phases that you may know from fossils in calcareous rocks um, are the uh, is a phase in the Devonian times that was dominated by predators uh, of the cephalopod group. So those had coiled shells with the gazers filling so that they could make themselves buoyant and they could therefore um, uh, conquer the water column. We also know the phases for bottom living of the trilobites. These are curious uh, ancestors of our modern crustaceans uh, that are also very often found in, uh, uh, in, in fossil form and dominated for hundreds of thousands if not millions of years basically unchanged. Uh, at the end of the Devonian, the first primitive fishes emerged. They still did not have a swim bladder, so they were bottom dwellers and they had partly um, very heavy armor um, that protected them from larger predators. And the sister groups of those uh, Placodermi, uh, they became the sharks. So the sharks are actually a very ancient group, but very successful to that very day. Um, and then <coughs> Yet another group that became extremely successful are the modern fishes that possess a swim bladder and uh, <coughs> radiated throughout the oceans starting 350 million years ago and are now by far the most species rich group of vertebrates. So where do we find the most species? As, um, um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the diversity gradients we see are quite similar to land. So we find a very heavy um, peak of diversity in the tropics and here it's in particular the Indo-Pacific that stands out in terms of diversity of very many different groups be it fishes or also invertebrates uh, and then in general uh, for understanding the diversity of the marine tropics is that the Tethys Sea uh, was an uninterrupted belt of tropical waters uh, until about 12 million years ago. So we had a large tropical ocean um, that, that was basically uh, a large area where a large uh, amount of diversity could evolve. And this is an example that we have to understand the geological basis, how ocean basins changed through time, um, through continental drift um, and formed compartments of smaller or larger size that allowed species to evolve. So what endangers diversity? So these are the big five. It's toxic and nutrient pollution. It's over-exploitation here in particular uh, fisheries. It's global change here, for example, warming itself and the dissolution of CO2 in the oceans, also called acidification. It could be direct destruction by the construction of ports um, and also the transport, the global transport of species among coastal areas, invasive species um, are the fifth menace to uh, current species diversity. And so what we actually face right now against the background of our ignorance, I've explained to you in the beginning, we only know less than a fifth of all species. What we're probably facing right now is a sixth mass extinction. Uh, also in the oceans. We know quite well the rates of increased enhanced extinction in terrestrial systems. Their rates are about 100 to 1000 times above the geological average. And so we expect that to be the same in the oceans. It's just that our ignorance prevents us at the moment from having 
good estimate. So this is a clear message to science has to do more here to develop species inventories and to monitor changes in species diversity. So the take home messages from this chapter are that <clears throat> we need to um, have good baselines to be able to detect changes in diversity. Um, that we um, have to define areas where diversity is very high in the oceans to identify conservation prime areas, conservation targets, since inevitably we probably cannot protect all the marine areas at the same level. And finally, it's certainly a good idea to single out charismatic species that are associated with a lot of other species as indicators both and to increase public awareness for marine biodiversity conservation and th those are for example manatees uh, or marine turtles uh, are also recently big predatory fish such as shark and tuna that are really threatened by overfishing.